Welcome, everybody. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Sarah Sterling is an adjunct assistant professor in the anthropology department at Portland State University. She also served as the Chuitsen Project geoarchaeologist during the 2004 excavations in Port Angeles. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Washington. And I'm gonna let Sarah take it away. Okay, well, thank you so much, Bonnie, and thank you everybody for inviting me to this. Um, I'm just gonna uh, walk you through a little bit of uh, what we learned from our excavations at Chuitsen in 2004, and also our subsequent analysis um, that I conducted with several of my colleagues, some from Portland State, some from Western Washington. Uh, Dennis is from the Suquamish tribe, uh, or he is the tipo for the Suquamish tribe, excuse me. Um, but uh, everything I'm going to be talking about today is, is taken from this paper, Building a Landscape History at Shuitsen. Um, and I also want to give a credit to my colleague, Sarah Campbell. Uh, a lot of the information I'm going to be sharing with you is really her baby. Um, I'm just curating it for her. Um, and so I uh, just want to make sure we understand that this is a very much a collective effort a lot of people have worked on this project over the years. Um, most recently, my colleagues, including Sarah and Dennis um, and Virginia Butler and uh, of Portland State and some other folks um, got an NSF grant 10, 12 years ago to um, continue studying some of the stuff we dug up in uh, 2004. So this is a long-term project with a lot of hands. So um, I'm just telling you my small part, but if you're really interested in a lot of what we've done, especially with the grant, you might have a look at this uh, publication. All right, so the site of Chiwitsen, uh, if you're from up there, you know the city of Port Angeles. Uh, Chiwitsen sits at the base of Edis Hook, which you can just barely see in that map. Um, and it uh, is a, a long-term, uh, over 2,000 years of occupation by the ancestors of the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe. And this is a historic map from the late 1800s uh, showing what Edith took would have looked like before it got super industrialized. The feature here is this tidal lagoon and then a kind of a series of beaches that formed over time as Edith's hook uh, started to form. Sorry, my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully it will continue to stay stable. Um, and again, here's where Chiwitsen is. And I wanted to point out also that the Klallam tribe is present all up and down both the southern and the northern, or, well, the southern coast of, or the coast of the Strait of Juan de Fuca on the Washington side and also on Vancouver Island. So this is not the only ancestral space that the uh, Klallam have occupied. Uh, we uh, focused on it because it was part of a, a, a cultural resources management project in 2004. And we were doing a lot of um, archaeological mitigation in advance of what we thought was going to be the construction of a graving dock that never uh, never got built. And I'd be happy to answer questions about that um, if people have them at the end, but I'm not going to dwell on it too much right now. Anyway, this is where we worked, but there's a lot more Lower Elwha Clallam history all up and down that coastline. This is an early reference to Shiwitsen from an, earth, uh, an ethnographer from 1920, T.T. Uh, Waterman, he observed that there was, it was known that was an old village site inside the spit, that's literally what Chivitsen means. Um, it was sit situated in a swampy place um, near the lagoon, uh, and it was very important during ancient times. He found only two households of people when he got there, but as many of you know, the U.S. Um, was succumbed to a lot of um, 18th, 18th and 19th centuries. So what you've seen, Clallam tribe has certainly rebounded over the last year, many, many years, and um, that's great. So what we're going to be talking about today are the impacts on this site from the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, we're going to be looking at geomorphic evidence of earthquakes and tsunami in the northern Washington region, and we're going to talk about um, evidence of those things that we can see from Chiwitsen as they correspond to um, oral historical evidence of tsunami from the region. So the first thing to discuss is the Cascadia, yeah, Cascadia subduction zone. Why are 
is that region where you are. I'm, I'm down in Portland, so I'm in a slightly different spot than the rest of you. Um, uh, but why is that region vulnerable to earthquakes and tsunamis? I guess we're vulnerable down here to earthquakes, less so tsunami. So this is the Cascadia uh, subjection zone. Um, and it is formed by the Strait of Juan de Fuca plate subducting under the North America plate right here. So the Strait of Juan de Fuca plate dives underneath and pushes up on that uh, North American plate and that builds up strain. Um, and here's where Chihuitzin is. So Chihuitzin is right at the, the heart of the action. So it's not surprising we're gonna see tsunami or seismic events um, represented in the deposits at Chihuitzin. And here's a, another graphic showing the same thing, but show, also showing you how that pressure builds up. And that's, so the, the, the plate slips under the North American plate, the one if you could plate does. Strain, everybody see this? I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. So anyway, here's the, the shoreline. And uh, again, where tsunamis are most likely to be impactful. Um, the, the, the redder the color, the more tsunami, I guess you're gonna see. Uh, Chihuitzin is right here where you kind of get an intermediate tsunami buildup of about one to five meters. So what is some of this geomorphologic evidence of tsunami? Um, these are some sites just along the coast of the Strait of Juan de Fuca where certain uh, seismic events have been identified. Um, these are places that are again, probably familiar, Salt Creek, Nia Bay, Discovery Bay, Swanton Mount, Marsh on Whidbey Island, et cetera. So these are all sites that are right up in that region. And these are some events that, that geomorphologists have identified. Um, the primary, one of the, the, for the primary people who work on this particular topic um, is Brian Atwater. And he first, well, one of his early discoveries was a de deposits at Willapa Bay in Southern Washington that records a long sequence of seismic events going back um, three, over 3,000 years. And so each of these bars with a letter is um, an event that has happened, um, starting with event Y and an earlier event going down to event L. We're going to be focusing on Y, W, U, Y, W, and U, and another um, event that's in here that that um, Atwater didn't see at Willapa Bay, but just real quick, Willapa Bay um, down here, close to the Columbia. It, it's distinctive because it has this ghost forest and this ghost forest um, is a series of trees that all died at the same time as the result of a tsunami. So unlike a lot of the other evidence of tsunami we can see in this region, um, the Willapa Bay material is actually a date on a seismic event or a series of seismic events. And here's just a general schematic of what happens is that a tsunami inundates the landscape and the trees that were living on a regular landscape that they liked died because they got poisoned by salt water. And then you can date all those trees, which Brian has done, and see what time they all died and, and know the age of the event that um, killed them. And I think in this case, this is the event why the most recent event about 300 years ago. And then a lot of these events have been seen also um, along the coast of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Nia Bay, Salt Creek, Discovery Bay, Swanton. And here you can see them, uh, the map showing where all those locations are. And once again, here's poor Chihuitzin right in the middle. So we're going to be expecting to see seismic events in this location. Oh, and I'll go back here. Um, but before I get into Chihuitzin, I just want to say brief talk a little teeny bit about Salt Creek Marsh because my colleague Ian Hutchinson and I, here's Ian right here, went to Salt Creek Marsh in uh, 2012 to look for tsunami deposits outside an archaeological site so that we could see that these events had actually happened. Um, we'll get into this in a little bit, but archaeological sites are, are hard places to identify seismic events because you can't always see the clear signs. The signs can be quite subtle. And in this case, we've just got two sand layers, uh, very subtle sand layers. Here they are up close, but they interrupt the um, soil development. 
the soil profile here. And this is just, a, a, this is not archeological, this is just geological, um, but they interrupt the soil development. So at, some, at two times in the past, a wave came into the Salt Creek Marsh bringing um, ocean sand and it deposited that sand across the landscape. Um, and here's another one, and that is a tsunami. So we can see evidence of two tsunami right here. Uh, the upper one, the upper sand, um, has a date underneath it of about 1530 to 1380 years ago. And what that suggests to us as, you know, as geoarchaeologists or geomorphologists and geoarchaeologists is that um, the sand that formed on top of this surface that dates to about, I don't know, 1500 to 1300 years ago, that, that tsunami subsequently came along afterwards about 1200 to 1230 years ago and deposited on top of that marsh surface. And so we know these seismic events are present in uh, deposits at Chiwitsan. We just have to look for them and they're a lot harder to see because they don't show up like those clean sand layers. So let's just look a little bit at the development and archeological evidence of uh, the landform development and archeological evidence from Chiwitsan. Uh, Eda's hook wasn't always there. It probably started to form about 3000 years ago. Um, as material from the lower or the Elwai River Delta moves westward with the current and it gets entrained right here, kind of stuck on this little bluff line and a little spit starts to form. And we have dates from this spot right here going back to 2,700 years ago where we have archaeological deposits that are both in sand and also in glacial drift. So the glacial drift is the initial substrate, sand forms on top of it as Eda's hook forms. So this little spot um, where we have this early date, the very earliest date we collected at Chiwitsun, um, is, is where that beach starts to form. So we can actually get a sense of when that landscape starts to form. So the beach is not, it has been there since about started to form about 3,000, 2,700 years ago. And then over time, um, the tidal lagoon starts to form as a little proto spit develops. When, as Eda's hook extends, it starts to kind of create a cur circulation current or current, you know, anyway, that circulates this direction, bringing sediments back and those build up and start to form this little spit. Um, and he, these are some of the earlier dates from that. Um, about 2100 to 18, 1700 years ago, there's a little spit here and this is starting to form the tidal lagoon and close it off. And then we can see this um, kind of the extension of the spit by about 1400, 1200 years ago, the spit has almost um, completely complete, closed off and created the tidal lagoon. So this is always a dynamic landscape. This is an always evolving landscape. and since we know people were there since 2,700 years ago, they witnessed this landscape evolving and moved along with it. And Sarah Campbell, again, put together this incredible graphic um, showing, um, you know, just all the kind of the different characteristics of the offshore area, the bathymetric information, what kind of sediments are down there. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but um, she did a great job of reconstructing all the events that led to the formation of the beach surface um, that's there now. And again, here's Chiwitsun. And so we can imagine that this is, by the time that this is for, you know, fully formed around, I don't know, 1500 years ago, more, more or less stable, that this is a nice place to build a, you know, start to build permanent structures. And we have evidence of these kinds of shed roof houses or the remains of these shed roof houses um, at the site, and we're going to talk a little bit about that now, but I want you to kind of enjoy this uh, vision so that you can get a sense of what a lower Elwha Clallam village might have looked like a long time ago. And this is a mural from the Fierro Marine Life Center um, at, in, in Port Angeles. And this is a little less whims or a little less illustrative, but um, more typical of archaeological information. We are going to talk we, we have information about earthquake and tsunami from two houses 
or the footprints of two houses, A1, which is right here, and A3 and A4. So there are the remains of, and then we have other plank houses from the site as well. This is just the two we focused on in our uh, NSF project. Um, but there is a lot yet to be worked on, certainly at Chuitsun. This is just uh, to show you kind of how, again, this is a Sarah Campbell production. This is not a Sarah Sterling production, but I'm gonna try and do it justice. How we can connect archeological deposits to what we know is a, is a house. So here we have, again, our illustration of houses. And we can imagine a house like this has a footprint sort of like this with an building everything up and all kinds of stuff like that. And so here are actual deposits from, uh, sorry, my internet connection is unstable again, uh, actual deposits from uh, the A1 unit. This is the foundation trench is dug all the way around the outside um, to keep, you know, to install the building, I guess, in the ground. Post holes, post holes. And again, these, some of them are load bearing. The larger ones are load bearing. Some of them are smaller. Uh, these large shed roof houses would be partitioned and different family units would live together within them. Uh, there would be local hearths and also central hearths uh, that people would gather around. So we have all these features that we actually recovered from the material in A1. And this is A4, the other house that we looked at. And you can kind of see those materials in the real world. Here we have posts and a floor surface. So this is a an area, this is part of a shed, shed roof house, I mean, kind of all that's left of a shed roof, here's another post, uh, shed roof house, um, as it looks archeologically. And then we collect radiocarbon dates from all these features so that we get a sense of how these houses changed over time. Uh, this is a profile view of the A1 house, and you can see similar features, post molds, the floor surface. So this is a big post, they held up a big house and then a floor surface on top of this layer of sand. And we'll talk about the layer of sand in a bit. Um, and this is the same, this is a, draw, the, the next slide will be a drawing basically of, of uh, stratigraphic deposits from within a house. So this is um, looking at those deposits uh, as drawings. But one of the things I wanted to point out is that it is because people lived at Chiwitz in over 27, hundred years, they rebuilt a lot of their old houses and remodeled them and built new houses where old houses once were. So a lot of the evidence of tsunami are obscured by human activity in some places. And so this boundary marks a floor surface, an upper floor surface. Again, this is back in the A1 house. Um, and you can see that underneath that we have a date that all this material, a lot of this material was deposited between 1500 and 1600 years ago. Um, but deposits sitting right on top of it were deposited um, between 600 and uh, 900 years ago. So this is not much stratigraphic difference, but this is a lot of chronological difference. So this upper construction dug into and um, kind of impacted the underlying older deposits. So that's one of the things we had to work with out there is, is teasing out where old houses ended and new houses began. So now I just want to talk about, you know, now that we kind of understand what these homes look like, what these houses look like archaeologically and also kind of ethnographically, um, you know, what, what are these what is the evidence of earthquakes and tsunami within these deposits? And these are, so I've got four categories of evidence I want to talk about. Wave up, uprush and backwash, which basically results in displacing material, cultural material, and then re-depositing it along a beach surface. Tsunami sand, um, which is um, basically just sand, like the sand we saw at Salt Creek Marsh only coming into Chiwitsen. Um, force and high velocity impact structure, which it results in a structural collapse. And finally, uh, local stories, regional stories of, um, or, or histories, regional, I'm sorry, regional oral histories of um, seismic events in terms of grounds taking floods and large waves. So first I wanna look at wave, wave uprush 
and backwash. And this is a schematic from a publication by Morton et al, uh, 2007. And they're really more interested in the, mo in the modern um, uh, tsunami event, uh, one that took place in Chile maybe 15 years ago, um, and comparing the difference between deposits that are result from storms versus de deposits that result from tsunami. And what you can see here is the tsunami deposit tends to be more draped across the landscape, whereas a storm deposit is fairly short, um, uh, not so well draped, not so extensive, more localized. And so you can take this idea and think about the more recent uh, Japanese tsunami, the Tohoku earthquake in 2011. And we have you know, the luxury of images from that earthquake, but here you can see a tsunami, or I'm sorry, that tsunami event coming in, coming inland this direction, picking up stuff as it does because it's a big impactful wave. And then when it recedes, it leaves behind a, a, a chaotic deposit, sometimes called a rack deposit, where the wave recedes and then all the stuff it's picked up falls out of it and drops on the landscape. And that's what these drape deposits are as well. So we can see these at Chuitzen. This is A4, um, which is one of the houses. Uh, and we can see that uh, tsunami moves inland. We can, in the map, you can see the, the same, same direction, moves across the landscape, the water is over here, and it picks up cultural materials as it moves inland and as it recedes, it deposits those cultural materials over the surface of the beach. So this deposit, while it's not a nice layer of clean sand, is probably a tsunami deposit, almost certainly. So that's a wave uprush and backwash deposit. Tsunami sand is a little more straightforward. Um, fascinating to say that this is actually a tsunami sand right here. And I think the thing that I find most interesting about it that somebody pointed out the last time I talked about this is that whatever building it got into must have been a very strong building because you can see here, this is a post mold, again, a big load bearing post mold and another smaller post mold. And the sand is inside the structure, but it didn't collapse the structure. So whatever event that, well, this was probably event W, which we'll talk about soon. Um, when that came in, it filled up this building or the foundation of this building with sand, but it didn't knock the building down. So by the time this event happened, uh, the ancestors of the little Elwha Clallam tribe had learned a lot about how to build resilient structures. High velocity and force. You know, we all know what earthquakes do. They shake things up, things break, things fall apart. And we can see that at Chiwitsun as well. Uh, in A4, again, the second of those houses, uh, we have these very fascinating, uh, well, to me, they're very fascinating because I'm easily fascinated, um, planks. And you can see they're outlined here. Uh, these are probably roof planks. So you can imagine a, a kind of a roof up here there's a shaking event, and then the roof planks slump down off the roof into a sand deposit at the foot of the dwelling. And so these roof planks are probably evidence, again, of some kind of seismic event. And here you can see them a little more close up. Uh, the roof planks here, uh, a post that's probably, that dates to the same time as the roof planks, um, a floor surface, um, and so we can, again, imagine a shaking event that caused a roof to come slumping off. And one of the reasons we know this is a roof, go back here, is because it had rocks on the top of it. Um, a lot of the uh, shed roof houses would have weights. They would weight, weight the roof down with rocks. And so we can see some of those rocks here, which is why, uh, again, Sarah Campbell uh, realized they were roof planks. And here you can see them close up because I really like those planks. Uh, and finally, uh, our fourth category of evidence, uh, oral history. And these are um, two stories of a recent event or two uh, accounts of a recent event. Um, the first is from the Macaw a long time ago, but not at a very remote period. The water from the Pacific flowed through what is now the swamp and prairie between Wyatch Village and Nia Bay. Uh, making the island an island of Cape Flattery. The water suddenly receded, leaving Nia Bay perfectly dry. 
It was days reaching its lowest ebb and then rose again without any waves or breakers until it had submerged the Cape and in many cases, the whole county. Um, many canoes came down in the trees and were destroyed. Numerous lives were lost. The water was four days remaining as the custom level. So this, if you know anything about tsunami, that sounds like an account of a tsunami. And there's a time period represented here too. So these, these oral histories capture real events and they provide us with eyewitness accounts of these events that we can't get to archeologically. So this information is very much uh, an important part of how we come to understand um, what happened at Huitzin over the years. And a Clallam account of a, a, a great flood not very long ago, perhaps not more than three or four generations. So again, there's a period of time represented there, you know, a generation about 24, five years. So we're not looking at a long span of time, we're looking at 100, 200 years in this statement. So these statements have uh, chronological information in them. And this is, uh, I'm not sure this exhibit is still there, but it was there four years ago, uh, uh, about uh, 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 material, the Chiwitsun um, site exhibit that the Clallam um, have put up at the uh, Carnegie uh, Museum slash library in Port Angeles, but this is just an exhibit. Um, and uh, Ed Sampson, who was a Clallam elder, again, a tran uh, translated a flood story that's very similar to the Macaw story. Um, after the water rose, the, the Clallam tied their canoes to the top of the highest mountain. Those who had fresh water and food survived. And so the, you know, the, the account mentions fresh water becoming salty. And you can see again that this is an account of an event that happened. And it's also an account of a kind of a survival strategy. People who had fresh water and food managed to endure this event. Um, and I think that's a cautionary tale for all of us is you just never know when these things are coming. Um, so how do we see these things at Chiwitsen? Uh, the first event I wanna show you that we can see is event U. Um, and event U is represented in those up, uprush and backwash deposits at A4. And here's that uh, exposure again. Same, same drape deposit right here or swash deposit or whatever you want to call it. Um, that's what we want to call it. Um, and here underneath it, stratigraphically, we have two dates of about 1700 to 1570 years ago. Um, BP just means before present. Um, but for all intents and purposes, that means 1,700 to 1,600 years ago. And then on top, we have, or within that swash deposit, excuse me, we have another date of about 1,500 to 1,410 BP. And so what this is telling us, all this material, this, this cultural material, existed before event U. And then when the tsunami came in and knocked everything down, that's the stuff that started to pull back out to sea with it and left behind on the, on the beach surface. So these dates are pretty consistent with the swash deposit that would have resulted from this event. Um, another event that's represented is the sand inside the building. I showed you the sand inside the building before. We're gonna look at it again. Um, here is the sand inside the building. Here's a date underneath it, well underneath it about 1200 to 1220 BP. Um, and on top of the sand, we have a date of about 730 to 680 BP, and another one of about 980 to 840 BP. And again, event W is thought to have taken place somehow where in this time frame. So this sand deposit is also consistent with a known event of a, a in this time frame anyway. And I realize all these dates are overlapping. I'm not giving you single points in time, but that's because that's not how radiocarbon dating works. It gives us an estimate of the amount of time elapsed since some organic material died. And there's always a little error term associated with those dates. And that's why we don't know the dates, the exact dates of these early seismic events either is for the same reason. We're using radiocarbon dating to get at them. But this looks pretty consistent with the sand. Uh, that's deposited by a tsunami. And this kind of sand was found across the site in patchy deposits all over the place, which makes me think that 
it's a real event that came in. And then because it's patchy, people then moved it around when they were rebuilding their buildings and whatnot. Um, this bed two sands, it's not a standard event from the Atwater chronology, but it's one that, that um, Kirk Peterson observed out at Mia Bay, and it was also seen at Discovery Bay. And it's basically, um, this didn't leave a tsunami deposit at A4, but it probably caused that structural collapse. And here are those planks again, and that sand. So that sand existed before the, the planks fell into it. Um, the planks are associated with a floor that dates to about 800 to 655 years ago. And that's this floor right here. Planks are connected to it. And then on top of the planks, there's another floor surface. You can see that dark sand. And that floor surface dates to about 500 to 400 years ago. And so there's a gap in between this floor surface and that plank collapse, and that corresponds with this bed two sands date. So here's again, more information that this shows you where that floor surface is relative to the planks, um, that there was a big event, shook the planks off the roof, they fell in the sand. And then later, many, many years later, the people came back and built another building on top of the old planks. This was fun to excavate. Um, and finally, event Y, which we primarily know about um, from oral tradition, but also from oral, tradi from oral tradition from the Japanese. Um, and we'll look at that in a bit here. But we, those two stories that I showed you before, the, uh, from the Makah and the Elwa, um, are both probably accounts of event Y, which is this. Uh, event Y has a very specific historical date because it was observed in Japan on January 26th in 1700, about just over 300 years ago. Um, and so that it, it's a known event actually with a calendar date. And then we can see that, uh, I'm sorry, Kurt Peterson found a corresponding um, sand layer at Mia Bay. Um, and Brian found a corresponding event at Willapa Bay. We didn't really see it at Salt Creek, but it shows up at Discovery Bay as well. And probably again, those, those accounts from the Macaw and the Elwha are um, accounts of this same event. So while we don't have a sand sheet per se, um, we do have the oral uh, traditions. And so again, um, we talked about these two uh, quotes and the quote about the Macaw, but it's this figure that's you know, not more than three or four generations, um, that's an important um, indicator of time. If it's not more than three or four generations, we are talking about a big event like event Y. So all of these things come together to tell us that you know, there were at least four big seismic events that impacted the Elwha, um, but they are still here. Um, they lived at the base of Eating's Hook, they were witness to recurring events in the tsunami. Um, evidence of these events can be seen in the site deposits of Chuitsen, but that they weren't, they did not displace this ancient population. These people, they came back, they learned how to live with it, they learned how to adapt to it. And they learned how to live on a dynamic and evolving land form. And over time, develop strategies to mitigate those impacts. Um, so there's a lot we can learn uh, from the people who live there. Um, long ago, and I am sorry about this. I usually know that one, two, three means, <laughs> I'm not sure why these are one, two, three, but anyway. Um, so these are just some thoughts I've had about this. And, um, you know, it's always been impressive to me to be able to work out there. I wanna thank everybody for their attention. And I hope that this uh, technical issue has not been too troubling for everybody. Um, but that's me in 2004 excavating at the site, sitting on, on that same floor surface with that same post. So I appreciate your time and I also appreciate all this, all the support that we've gotten for this project over the years. Most importantly, the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe um, for continuing to su support and collaborate with us on this work. Without them, um, none of this would be happening um, or would have happened. Uh, the National Science Foundation Polar Programs Grant, the 2011 PSU Faculty Enhancement Grant and all these wonderful people um, who've uh, helped us out uh, with this project over the years. So I thank everybody for their time and I'm happy to answer questions.